After the last wild European bison was killed in 1919, conservationists thought the end was certain. Only a handful of Europe's largest land mammals remained, all of them in captivity. These magnificent creatures, also known as Wiesent, once roamed Europe from the Caucasus to the Atlantic, dominating the land, inhabiting the forests of France and the steppes of Russia. These once majestic creatures that shared the landscape with woolly mammoths and cave lions were now found behind fences and in special recovery centers. The Industrial Revolution of the early 20th century devastated the natural habitat of the European bison. Entire ecosystems were gone with the continued expansion of human communities. Breeding areas where the wild European bison thrived were cleared to build towns and villages. Their numbers dwindled significantly until the last wild European bison fell to a hunter's rifle in the Bialoviesia forest. An entire species reduced to 54 individuals held in captivity, surviving solely by the benevolence of its captors. What next, everyone wondered. Would the European bison go into extinction like its counterparts, who did not survive the Ice Age? Far from it. Thanks to the intervention of a few conservationists who took a bold move of rewilding these animals in the high, rugged Tarku Mountains of Romania's southern Carpathians. So many scientists considered the move a risky gamble with an already endangered species, but little did they know what impact this single move would make. To understand the story of Europe's largest land mammal, let's start from the beginning. Archaeological evidence suggests that these giants have roamed for the last 12,000 years, outlasting the Ice Age and adapting so well to the changing climate over centuries. Medieval tales speak of the bison as a large herd thundering through the forest in their thousands. Bison hunting was reserved for royalty in Lithuania. Even Polish kings considered these beasts to be so precious that killing one without permission warranted a death sentence. How did a creature that was a symbol of raw strength and untamed power dwindle to such few numbers that left them teetering on the edge of extinction? For starters, the invention and mainstream spread of firearms made hunting bison a more popular pastime. These once sacred animals became easy prey for armed hunters and even the star prize of some hunting events. In a similar vein, growing militarization meant local wildlife dwindled as armies used them to feed soldiers. Primitive hunters might have organized for days just to bring down an adult bison due to its sheer strength, speed, and agility, but for armed men it was one shot in a couple of minutes. During World War I, entire herds of bison were slaughtered in the Polish village of Bialowieja by the occupying German forces for food and sport. On top of that, troop movements and construction also destroyed breeding sites and disrupted ecosystems. Europe's exploding population as a result of the Industrial Revolution was the final axe that landed the blow. In a literal sense, much of Europe's forest was chopped down. Railways needed to be constructed through the continent, most of them cutting through the bison's migration routes. Post-industrial agriculture also introduced high-yield monocultures and heavy livestock grazing, pushing bison further out of their territory and increasing their competition. That means not only were bison hunted for food, their habitat quickly disappeared, making life for the thinning survivors more difficult. This way, entire populations were reduced in such a short time that what remained of these ancient wandering beasts was a small genetic pool of 54 individuals scattered across zoos and private sanctuaries. The dilemma was very obvious. With a genetic pool that small, inbreeding was likely to become a problem, and many scientists believed the species was doomed. All but a small group of visionary conservationists, led by a Polish zoologist, Jan Stolkman. At a time when nature conservation was considered secondary to economic development, he was one of the few voices calling for urgent action. Besides Stolkman, another significant player in preserving the bison's genetic diversity was Heinz Heck, the director of the Munich Zoo. In collaboration with his brother, Lutz Heck, who was the director of the Berlin Zoo, they were able to collect and coordinate the surviving captive bison from zoos and private reserves. Brave as they were, these people who believed in re-establishing the bison in their natural habitat started the International Society for the Preservation of the Vicent. Stolkman's plan to rescue the endangered bison was proposed in Paris at the 1923 International Conference for Nature Conservation, 
Zoo Berlin was the birthplace for this initiative, as prominent zoologists and wildlife experts came together to launch their ambitious project of repopulating Europe with the European bison. This was not like other breeding projects. They were essentially hoping to create a wild population by introducing the captive animals into a landscape that hadn't seen bison for centuries. This plan would take years of meticulous planning and immense funding. It was not just enough to let the animals roam freely. This small founding population of bison had to be carefully managed to prevent inbreeding and maximize genetic diversity. Every single bison had to be tracked carefully to make sure that it was not breeding with a mate that was too genetically similar. With such few numbers, the preservationists had to be meticulous in their monitoring, as too many generations of inbreeding would surely lead to disaster. So they created a register, the first stud book created to document the pedigree of wild species. The European Bison Pedigree Book, as this stud book came to be known, was established in 1932 to track every single breeding decision. The parentage of every calf was known, and very slowly these scientists grew the number numbers. That tiny founding population of 54 soon ran into hundreds, and the main mission of Jan Stolkman and his merry band of bison saviors could now proceed with their original mission of returning them to the wild. But how does a bison population go from living in pens to roaming freely in the wild, fending for themselves and having unassisted births? The process had to be gradual, especially with the fact that these captive breeds had to first acclimatize to the new environment and be monitored closely to detect any difficulty along the way. Rewilding Europe and WWF Romania partnered in 2012 to begin this gradual but crucial process. The Tarku Mountains, located in Romania at the edge of the southern Carpathians, were chosen to carry out this project. The region used to be teeming with wild European bison before they dwindled significantly. The southern Carpathians of Romania was one of Europe's most promising landscapes for rewilding. Over 2.2 million hectares of ancient forests, river valleys, alpine meadows, and mountain peaks. A relatively large ecosystem that could handle a diversity of life and offer free space to roam for reintroduced species. For the first time in over 200 years, the European bison set foot in the Roman Carpathians on May 17, 2014. History was made, taking the captive animals and making them into free-ranging animals. They weren't simply just picked up and dropped in the middle of nowhere on the Tarku Mountains, as one would assume. A lot of preparation was done in terms of feasibility studies and community engagement. If the same humans who had nearly driven these animals to extinction weren't curtailed, it was only a matter of time before they would be back to square one. A 15-hectare acclimatization enclosure was built, where the first group was placed. The group consisted of eight females and nine males of various ages, bringing the total number of introduced individuals to 17. These large acclimatization enclosures allowed the bison to adapt to their environment without wandering off on their own. It was also easy for the researchers to study their behavior and health in this way. More importantly, it kept poachers at bay, allowing the bison population to find its feet before becoming target practice. These initial years tested everyone's resolve, especially that of the researchers and donors to the cause. The newly released animals were unfamiliar with the terrain. Some struggled to find food, and many others could not adapt quickly to the seasonal rhythms of their new environment. Social hierarchies between the animals were out of balance, and this led to conflict between animals. Not to mention that the Carpathian region was known for its harsh winters, with deep snow and super low temperatures, presenting a challenge to captive animals that were used to the regulated environment from which they came. Worse, even, was the fact that no one had considered the prospect of predators. The Carpathian region was also home to wolves and bears, although they did not directly hunt the adult bison, which were rather too strong and obstinate. They preyed on the defenseless calves. Although the early years were rough, the bison eventually began to adapt. New social hierarchies formed, and finding food became relatively easy. The animals learned to navigate the steep terrain of the mountain ranges and cope with harsh winters. And most importantly, the first set of calves were born, making them true, wild European bison. Birthing new calves meant that the bison was not just adapting, but also thriving. Many of the sensibilities that their parents lacked due to being raised in captivity, these new crops would learn quickly, like escaping predators. Once they had acclimatized, the first group was released from the enclosure after two years in 2016. Another group of 23 bison was introduced to the wild in 2018, 
This time, two sites were picked out for the reintroduction exercise, Tarku and Poyana Ruska. By 2021, over 100 bison was roaming in the Tarku Mountains, with about 40 calves born in the wild. Researchers are monitoring these populations using GPS collars to learn about their movements and other field technology to quickly detect emergency and stressful situations. What started as the collective effort of very passionate wildlife conservationists has caught on like wildfire. Their recorded success in the Tarku Mountains has inspired other rewilding projects that are being launched across Romania. In the nearest future, what we might have is a network of bison populations that are connected through wildlife corridors. Many bison have ventured dozens of kilometers from their original release sites, spread quickly across the terrain. That population of 54 has grown so much that they are about 9,000, with over 3,000 now living in free or semi-free conditions across 10 countries in Europe. Despite most of these being semi-wild animals raised in fenced-off reserves, it signals hope for the truly free-ranging bison population. Belarus and Poland remain home to the largest wild populations, each boasting of over 2,000 individuals roaming the country. Following closely is Russia, with a population of over 1,500 bison. Other countries that have a significant bison population include Germany, Romania, and Ukraine. Recognizing the immense effort put into rewilding Europe with wild European bison, the IUCN has reclassified the species from vulnerable to near-threatened. While this is more than enough win for the conservationists, who have put in a lot of work to make this happen, they deserve accolades for the resulting ecological impact. The wilderness-like environment that was the Tarku has been completely transformed. Despite the erroneous belief by locals, who described these introduced animals as voracious eaters that posed a threat to the farming life, areas where bison now graze have shown increased biodiversity, transforming into pasture lands flowering plants are starting to bloom in the region again. Ecologists call the European bison ecosystem engineers. They do not graze like domesticated cows, as the locals presume. Herds of bison create a mosaic landscape, as they feed on some plants, but not others. That means closely cropped areas are interspersed with taller vegetation. Feeding this way creates a heterogeneous grazing pattern, encouraging the development of diverse microhabitats. Areas of short grass serve as a hunting ground for birds of prey, while ground-dwelling birds can nest in areas with taller grass. A landscape ecologist, Dr. Marina Druga, has revealed in her research that areas grazed by the Tarku bison support 30% more plant species than ungrazed areas. A strange way that the bison benefits the environment is their dust baths, done by rolling on the ground to remove parasites and regulate temperature. A seemingly harmless act, but quite beneficial for the ecosystem, as the dents they leave in the soil become temporary pools during rainy seasons. Bison might not be pollinators like bees, but they also play a crucial role in plant propagation. Their thick coats pick up seed as they move through vegetation, spreading them as they travel. A single bison can carry thousands of seeds on its fur, effectively allowing the spread of new vegetation wherever it roams. Their dung is also nutrient-rich, allowing the seeds to take root and germinate in the region. The return of Europe's largest mammal to the wild was not entirely met with positivity, even with its immense benefit to the ecosystem. Yes, there were some locals who were excited about the ecological and tourism potential of their return, but many others worried about a few things, not quite accepting the idea when the conservationists told them about their plan. For one, there are concerns about the competition between bison and livestock for grazing areas. The local Armenis commune near the Tarku Mountains were particularly concerned about how big the animals were. According to Florin Marinescu, mayor of the commune, people are afraid that the animals are dangerous. Will they enter the farm and damage crops? What if they charge at you when you're close by? The International Society for the Protection of the European Bison recognized their fears and invested heavily in community engagement. They organized information sessions and addressed these concerns, even training some of the local residents to become wildlife guides. A compensation scheme has also been established to address any damage caused by the bison to crops and property. But even with those incentives, little damage has been reported by the locals. 
Bison watching is now very common in these areas, opening a new economy to the locals. Guest houses, restaurants, and craft shops have sprung up in the areas to accommodate the visitors. It is estimated by the Romanian Ministry of Tourism that bison-related tourism now generates 2 million euros annually for the region. In 2022, a collaborative study by WWF Romania and Rewilding Europe revealed that the reintroduced bison in the Tarku Mountains cover a range of more than 200 square kilometers, with some individuals traveling over 80 kilometers from their original release sites. GPS data showed that the bison use forest edges, alpine meadows, and even old logging roads to navigate the landscape, suggesting that they are actively reshaping their environment. This has sparked new conversations around wildlife corridors in the southern Carpathians, where conservationists aim to connect fragmented habitats for bison, bears, lynx, and wolves. Supported by EU biodiversity funding, the goal is to establish a connected wilderness area across Romania and neighboring countries. The Tarku herd is now considered one of the most genetically valuable free-roaming populations in Europe, offering not just hope for the bison, but a blueprint for rewilding large mammals across the continent. The successes in establishing the wild bison population in Romania are remarkable. However, there still remain challenges that need to be overcome. Disease management is one such challenge. Repopulating from a small founding population has made bison potentially vulnerable to even the simplest pathogens in their natural habitat. Close health monitoring is still needed to keep the animals healthy. Researchers still intervene regularly during harsh winters by providing supplemental feeding in order to prevent starvation. It is a thin rope to walk, as they need to maintain self-sufficiency in the wild. Besides, poaching by local residents, although rare, is still a challenge too. Overall, proactive measures are being employed to maintain the progress gained. Modern technology has been very essential, especially the use of GPS collars and remote cameras to monitor the animal movements, behavior, and breeding success. Interesting, don't you agree? Pulling back a species from the brink of extinction and re-establishing them in their natural habitat. Do you think the locals have every right to be against repopulating the region with wild European bison? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Ensure you like the video and avoid missing out on our next episode by subscribing to our channel.